Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Agile Business Intelligence, what it is, why you might need it, and how you can achieve it, hosted by the Aberdeen Group and sponsored by Neutrino BI. My name is Joe Venezia, and I'll be your moderator. We're joined by three fantastic speakers today, David White, Senior Research Analyst for the Business Intelligence Practice at Aberdeen Group, Neil, Neil Pratt, uh, Assistant Principal, CAS at Bourneville College, and Neil Thomas, a Sales Director at Neutrino BI. And our first speaker today will be David White. David has 20 years' experience in the software industry, including roles in development, software engineering, consulting, product management, product marketing, and industry marketing. At Aberdeen Group, David's a senior research analyst in the business intelligence practice with a major focus on understanding the business value from the use of business intelligence and how organizations use BI to drive strategic and operational change. And, uh, David, you know, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Joe, and thank you all for joining today. So I have about 20 to 25 minutes to run you through a number of topics, uh, as you can see here on the slide. First of all, I'll take just a couple of minutes just to run through our research methodology. Now, that's quite possibly not the most exciting opening to a presentation ever. But without that, the rest of my slides really wouldn't make much sense. So after that, we'll look at what is really driving organizations to look for more agile BI solutions, and what strategies they're putting in place to gain that agility. Following that, we'll look at uh, the companies with the most agile BI solutions, what Aberdeen refers to as best in class. And we'll learn what it is they do differently to other companies in order to really gain the agility that they have. And finally, I'll finish by just summarizing the benefits so that we can see uh, both how organizations and individuals can gain from implementing a more agile analytic solution. And we'll also have a quick polling question in the middle there too. So firstly, the research methodology then. There's a, a couple of things that make Aberdeen different from other research firms. First of all, all our research findings are based on facts that we draw from end user communities of tech, uh, users of technology. And so for example, the business intelligence practice alone has collected data from over 7,000 companies in the last couple of years. And the second thing that's different about us is we have a benchmarking approach. So we use online surveys and follow-up interviews to collect data from end users. And that survey collects really two main sets of data. First of all, we ask questions to understand what keeps executives and managers awake at night and what are they doing to sleep better. So we ask what pressures they face around a particular topic, such as agile business intelligence, what strategies they're executing to deal with the pressures that they face, and what capabilities that organization has or is developing. And we also ask about the technologies they're using or plan to use. The second part of the survey we ask about a number of performance metrics. Now, these can be quite wide-ranging uh, depending on the research topic, but can include high-level business metrics such as customer retention rates or profitability, uh, through to more IT-focused measures such as how uh, often BI data is refreshed or how long it takes on average to add a new data source to a data warehouse. So once we've collected that survey data, we use a number of wage uh, metrics, an aggregate of a, a number of metrics, to really separate the top performing companies from everybody else. And more specifically, we segment all survey respondents into one of three groups. The best in class are the top performing 20%, the laggards are the bottom performing 30%, and industry average are the middle 50. And once we've done that segmentation, uh, and we've, we've got that three-way split, the best in class, the industry average, and the laggards established. Then we can overlay the data from the rest of the survey, the pressures, the actions, the capabilities, and the technologies that are used. And from there, we can build a roadmap to help all organizations, even the best in class, improve that performance. We can tell them what processes they need to have in place, what metrics and KPIs they need to measure, what technologies they might need, organizational changes they might need to make, and so on. And so in summary then, each benchmark uh, really does two things. First of all, it clearly identifies those organizations that are getting the most business value from their use of various technologies. And secondly, by highlighting the differences in strategies, tactics, and technologies employed by those leading organizations and then comparing them to everybody else, we can really start to put together a roadmap for everybody to improve that performance. And that's the basic framework that we're using here uh, to establish the best in class organizations and then look at what they do differently to everybody else. So let's move on and talk about what's driving agile business intelligence and what really what the key to agility is. 
Now, personally, for me, there's really only one metric that I consider to be the most important when it comes to measuring how effective any BI, BI implementation is. And very simply, that's how often are you able to get the right information to the right people in time to affect their decision making. And that, after all, is really what the whole point of business intelligence or, or analytics is. Any other factors such as cost or, or query response times are really just secondary considerations. Fundamentally, if you can't deliver the right information to the right people in time to impact their decisions, then BI really has no value, regardless of anything else. So when I talk about Agile business intelligence, what I mean is this. Agile BI is a BI implementation that is flexible enough to be able to quickly adapt to meet changing business needs. In other words, ask yourself this. Is your analytics solution able to change easily to answer questions that weren't anticipated on the day it was first implemented? So given that definition of Agile BI, when we ask companies what pressures they're struggling with uh, in order to develop a more Agile BI solution, it turns out there are two major factors that really conspire to cause IT executives some real pain between the ears. First of all, just over half of survey respondents note that the increased demand for management information is a real pressure. That is, business users are increasingly asking for access to new data or for different ways to see existing data. Secondly, 38% of survey respondents report that the growing data volumes and our number of data sources that they need to wrestle with is also a problem. Collectively then, corporate IT is stuck between the proverbial rock and a hard place. On one side, there's more data flowing into the organization than ever before, and that data is often more complex than ever before, and corporate IT has to find a way to deal with that and turn raw data into valuable information. Not only does IT have to find a way to deal with that problem, but on the other side of the equation, it has an increasingly demanding business community clamoring for more and better access to information. Not only that, but 65% of business managers tell us that their decision window is shrinking. That is, the time they have to make decisions after business events occur is being compressed. So essentially, then, the rate at which that raw data needs to be turned into, into management information is accelerating, too. So when we ask people what they're doing strategically to gain agility in the face of increasing data volumes and a more demanding community of BI users, almost two-thirds, 62%, say that self-service is the answer. But what does self-service mean when it comes to business intelligence and analytics? In a nutshell, I think it really means helping business decision makers to be able to find the information they need in a timely way with little or no assistance from people with hardcore BI skills, such as the corporate IT department. And self-service really comes into its own, if you think about it, when business managers are faced with questions that just were not anticipated at the time the original BI solution was conceived. So, for example, when an urgent problem arises or an opportunity emerges suddenly, can business managers find the information they need to help their decision-making directly by themselves or do they need to go to corporate IT and get a skilled specialist to build reports for them? As you can imagine, how you answer that question can have a massive impact on how long it takes to find the answers to unanticipated questions. And while technology is always important, there are many other factors that are critical for BI to be truly agile, and we'll go into detail on some of those. Broadly speaking, though, I'll group those into four buckets. The right tools the right culture, the right attitude, and the right support. Joe, can we push the polling question, please? Sure. There we go. Oops, uh, excuse me. There it is. So I'm just curious, uh, having said that uh, self-service BI is really the answer to um, getting a more agile BI solution, I'm curious as to what challenges you see to having self-service BI in your own organization. So we'll just pop this poll up here for about 30 seconds and see what people come back with. And just to recap on, on uh, where I was on this last slide as well, I talked about the right software tools, clearly are important. Right corporate culture is important too. Business managers really need to operate in a, a corporate culture that encourages and values decisions that are based on facts and information and not just based on gut feel. 
Attitude matters too, as one survey respondent noted to me. For some users, it's easy to make them more self-sufficient. But for others, I'm not sure that you can get them to make that leap because they simply don't want to. And that can be a real challenge for some people. So we're seeing the, uh, the numbers really starting to bed down now, I think, as everybody's uh, finished answering here. So, um, okay, interesting that data fragmentation is a challenge. Uh, I can certainly talk to that a bit later. 45% uh, of people coming back with that. And also that the fact that the existing BI tools they have are too hard to use, which, again, I think is something I hear from a lot of people. Um, but certainly I see a, a new generation of tools emerging now, I think, which can really help people with that problem. Okay, Joe, next slide, please. So let's move on, and then we'll, we'll talk about what it is to be best in class in Aberdeen terms, and then we can look at how do you get to be best in class? How do you improve your performance in being agile with business intelligence? So the data I have here then was collected in April of this year, 2012, uh, and Aberdeen measured the agility of the BI solutions at 112 organizations that participated in the survey. And based on their aggregate uh, performance in three criteria is how we judged their agility. Now, we used criteria that reflected the ability of the business intelligence implementation to get the right information into the hands of the right people at the right time, as well as the ability to respond quickly when changes to reports and dashboards were required. In other words, how quickly was the organization able to respond when line of business managers needed to see different information? And you can see those down the, uh, the left-hand side there. And as I discussed when I covered Aberdeen's research methodology, the top performing 20% of companies are the best in class, the bottom performing 30% are the laggards on the right, and the other 50% in the middle are called industry average. And now and again, just for fun, I'll actually refer to the industry average group and the laggards together that 80% of all others, so we'll do a comparison for best in class to all others, just to simplify some of the results and charts that we have. So when we looked at those three metrics then shown on the left, this is what we found. Managers at best-in-class organizations are able to get timely information 92% of the time. And while the industry average organizations in the middle there did pretty well too, 84%, as you can see over in the right-hand column, laggards only fare half as well as best-in-class organizations. Or to put it another way, at laggards, over half of the management decisions are made without the relevant facts because they just can't get the information when they need it. And the other two metrics used to distinguish best-in-class companies reflect the ability of the organization to respond to meet changing requirements for the BI system, such as the time to modify a report and the time to create a new dashboard. Now, in these areas, too, we can see that best-in-class organizations comfortably outperform industry average organizations who, in turn, comfortably outperform laggards. For example, as you can see on the bottom row of this chart, it takes industry average organizations 15 times longer to create a new dashboard than best-in-class organizations. It takes laggards almost 30 times as long. So those are the three metrics we use to identify the best-in-class together with the corresponding performance differences that we see between best-in-class, industry average, and laggards. So now let's go ahead and look at some of the findings from the research so we can understand what are the things that best-in-class organizations do differently to everybody else in order to get the agile analytics implementations that they have. First of all, there are four technologies that we identified that are used more by best-in-class organizations than others, as you can see here on the chart. So almost all best-in-class companies, 95% use dashboards, compared to two-thirds of other organizations. Now, one of the nice things about dashboards is that managers can see many key performance indicators on a single, highly interactive, highly visual page. And this means a large amount of summarized information can be seen and assimilated quickly, even from across multiple business functions if desired. Now, if the dashboards are refreshed regularly, and the right frequency quite honestly depends on the exact business needs, this alone can help organizations to be more agile and responsive, since relevant information can be put right in front of the relevant decision makers. In addition, nearly half of best-in-class organizations, 47%, also use visual data discovery tools. 
Now, this type of BI tool provides an extremely interactive and rich way for people to explore and manipulate information in real time. So with this type of tool, most or, or all of the, the respondents, all of the responsibility, sorry, uh, for creating and maintaining views of the information really sits with the business users directly. In that regard, the role of corporate IT is greatly reduced and really often amounts to just to creating and maintaining a repository of really high quality data for people to access. Visual data discovery, as you can imagine, can be a real benefit for managers who often have to handle unanticipated questions with only a small decision window. As I said at the outset, that's really one of the challenges that people are, are seeing now. That decision window, the time they have to react is getting compressed all the time. So in addition, what we've also found from our research is that visual data discovery can really help to lift a big burden from the shoulders of corporate IT because they're no longer on the hook to create all the reports and dashboards and charts that people need. That part of the, uh, the BI responsibility, that part of the BI solution, is effectively pushed down onto the end user community. The third point on this chart, the second uh, set of bars down, in fact, in-memory analytics. Now, this can really improve the performance of both dashboards and visual data discovery tools when it comes to data manipulation. In-memory simply means that all relevant data is loaded into the computer's RAM where it can be manipulated much faster, many, many thousands of times faster than if the data was being swapped continually between the RAM and a hard disk. Now, you, you can imagine probably that, that impact is even greater when a large set of, or, of data or, or complex manipulations are involved as operations that may have taken hours in the past can now be completed in just seconds. So there are really orders of magnitude of performance improvements that people can get from in-memory analytics in the right circumstances. And finally, on the bottom of this chart, then you can see that twice as many best-in-class organizations use natural language interfaces with BI compared to other organizations. And this can be a great way to really bring down the obstacles uh, around ease of use for uh, BI solutions, providing people with a way to find management information using simple sentence-like constructs, just like they would in Google or any other search engine. That can be a really great way to get the, uh, the less tech-savvy business managers using analytics hands-on. We talked about the right culture being important, too. And as we said, providing the right tools is really only one part of the puzzle. Best-in-class organizations, we found, also have a number of cultural factors, organizational cultural factors, which come into play, three of which are shown here. Now, strictly speaking, you might say that the ability to drill down into data or to, to have a fully interactive display of data, well, really, they're all, they're all parts of uh, technical capabilities. And, of course, they are. But if they're to be taken full advantage of, then the right cultural expectations also need to be in place. So, for example, drill down allows managers to easily navigate from high-level summary information to the related detailed data beneath that. Now, as such, drill down can be a great first step to help managers identify cause and effect relationships. So, for example, if we imagine a healthcare provider or a hospital that wants to improve the quality of the care that it provides. Now, a simple static report or chart can, can show the areas where care quality is poor. But for any kind of corrective action to be taken, more detailed analysis is required. And that analysis might reveal, for example, that particular doctors were performing poorly or perhaps the shortcomings are all due to a particular hospital facility, for example. So while drill down can really help managers understand cause and effect relationships, that's only really possible if senior management empowers them to do so. And a common barrier that we see to the more widespread use of analytics is simply that senior managers are not willing to give up control. Either they don't trust more junior managers to make decisions or they simply want to retain control for political reasons. And the same can be true with very interactive forms of BI, such as visual data discovery. If senior management isn't willing to give up some power and let some decisions be made at a lower level, then the use of such tools can be very limited. So there has to be some kind of cultural expectation around this and empowerment that happens here too. Having the right tools just isn't enough. But the final point on this slide as well shows that best-in-class organizations have a more enlightened approach, shall we say, where business managers are more likely to initiate analytics projects compared to other, in other organizations. 
Now, interestingly enough, in our research, um, we found that this is even more true of organizations that are working with big data. So what we're starting to see here, I think, is, is a trend that analytics is becoming more democratized than in the past. In the past, because so much of a, a BI project had to be controlled and managed and resourced by the IT organization, I think users had relatively little say in the prioritization of projects. What we're starting to see now is that more and more analytics projects are being initiated and driven by business leaders. And as I said, this is particularly notable where big data is concerned. And I think partly that's because the availability of data now is so good that it's really opening up all kinds of possible applications for BI and analytics that just weren't practical or cost-effective in the past. So the expectations of senior management is, is one thing, but the expectations of more junior managers need to be aligned too. We all know you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Now seriously, self-service analytics can't happen unless the users are ready, willing, and able. And that willingness is partly reflected in this chart. As you can see, almost two-thirds of best-in-class organizations allow and encourage BI users to tailor reports, charts, and dashboards to suit their own needs and tastes. Only 22% of laggards, in contrast, only a third of many laggards allow this to happen. So this level of involvement, I think, is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, for example, suppose we develop a, a BI application to track the performance of the sales team. Now, as simple as that sounds, there will be many different user roles that want to see different data or the same data presented in a different way. For example, individual account managers will want to see detailed data on just their accounts, while a regional sales manager will want a broader but shallower view. Taking it up a, another level to the C-level or senior executives, they'll want to see sales performance across the entire company, including potential multiple sales teams and product lines. But they won't really care, for example, um, who the account manager is for those accounts. They just want that very high-level view of the data across the entire organization. But despite all these different needs, the resources of the IT organization are always, as you know, very limited. Now, data we collected in our 2011 Agile BI survey showed that organizations have an average of 143 days of BI-related project work outstanding in the queue. So in practice, then, it's really unlikely that the IT organization will be able to customize the BI solution to exactly fit the needs of every single user. And yet we know from experience that the more solution easily provides the exact information that each, each, uh, each individual requires, then the more they are likely to engage with it and use that on a regular basis. So allowing individual users to customize what they see and how they see it, I think can really help to close the gap here in usability. And that customization can take many forms. Some users may simply want to change the colors on a bar chart or apply a filter to a report just to show their accounts, for example. On the other hand, other users may wish to create entirely new charts or add new metrics and key performance indicators. And I'll provide some tips later on Attitude uh, in a few slides as well. But I think really encouraging users to get involved in the project is something that the best in class, as you can see, are much more likely to do, and that makes sure they get a better fit of the solution to meet those end user needs. And that all comes down ultimately to timely delivery of the right information. But in best-in-class companies, the right attitude extends further than that, too. Now, as you know, many BI solutions involve data integration, bringing data together from two or more data sources. Now, without demeaning the art and science of data integration, if I had to describe it in a single word, that word would be plumbing. So when it comes down to it, there are a couple of choices for data integration. Data integration can be a heavyweight, highly skilled industrial scale process, or it can be child's play. And if you can make it as easy as that, then data integration is also a process that end users can undertake themselves in certain circumstances. And as you can see from the chart, best-in-class companies are twice as likely as others to allow self-service data integration. That's not to say they don't have highly skilled integration staff. Often they do. But inevitably, there will be times when business users want to combine formally managed corporate data assets with data that lies outside the scope of the control of corporate IT. 
For example, imagine a product line manager has data in a spreadsheet from a customer survey. Now, there may be real value in that for the manager in integrating that data with a data warehouse that has information on sales revenues for various product lines, for example. But unfortunately, it's just that one manager. That particular task might be such a low priority for corporate IT that it never, ever gets done. So in this type of situation, it can make sense to provide the tools to business managers so that they can undertake their own data integration in a very simple, very controlled way. And so finally, as you make the transition to a more self-service approach to business intelligence, it is important not to leave your business intelligence users floundering around like fish out of water. So there are a number of things that best-in-class organizations do to ensure that they provide business managers with the best possible support and the best possible chance of being successful. The first two at the top of the chart are really tied to a simple concept that I consistently see at best-in-class organizations, and that is automate the routine so that you have more time for the unusual. So at 90% of best-in-class organizations, then, they automatically generate and distribute standard reports. So the kind of routine information that managers always need on a periodic basis can easily be handled by this approach. For example, the shipping list for everything that's going to be dispatched today, uh, the patient census for everyone in the hospital when a shift begins, daily updates on retail sales, and so on. These are all examples of management information requests that can be defined once and then refreshed and distributed automatically whenever needed. Similarly, best-in-class organizations are more likely to have a standard project plan in place for their BI projects. Now, I know that no two business intelligence projects are, are ever the same, but there is often enough commonality from one project to the next for it to make sense to, uh, to have a formal project plan that can be applied to every project. By providing a standard but flexible project plan for analytics, organizations are more likely to deliver a solution that meets the end user requirements on time and on budget. Now, decentralizing support is important too, and best-in-class organizations are 37% more likely to do that than other companies. Essentially, then, this approach embeds key skills, perhaps uh, BI analysts or power users, within each department or business unit. Now, providing this help physically close to the users who are getting to grips with self-service analytics for the first time can really help them to get on their feet and to be more self-sufficient as time goes by. And finally, at the bottom there, you can see the best-in-class organizations are twice as likely as others to build a plan for cultural change into their project plans. So because self-service analytics has so many different expectations for so many people, it makes sense to plan for that during the project to make sure that analytics really takes root. For example, it may be necessary for line of business managers to be encouraged or even incentivized to start using analytics to guide decisions in situations where the company previously worked in a, in a way where just a few key executives made decisions. Training is essential too. Training in the concepts of analytics and working with data, uh, training in the specific tools available and what they're appropriate for, and ideally training with the actual data that managers will work with on a daily basis. So what it comes down to then is really standardize and automate the routine work so you can have more time to help users become self-sufficient. So let me wrap up then. Why is all this important? We've seen from the, the definition we had before, best-in-class companies are able to get the information they need in the time they need it 30% more likely than other organizations, 92% compared to 71%. So at best-in-class organizations, decisions are more likely to be supported by data than just being based on best guess or office politics. There's 40 7% more employees have access to BI or analytics at best-in-class companies. Now, this is key. The annual research into operational BI that Aberdeen conducts consistently shows that those organizations that have the most widespread and deepest adoption of business intelligence are able to grow their profits faster, improve customer retention rates faster, just to name a couple of metrics. And the reason that this more widespread adoption is possible is because self-service naturally reduces the workload on corporate IT so they can spend their time putting analytics further, uh, more broadly deployed within the organization, not just keep making new reports all the time. 
And finally, then we see that those companies that are best in class also seem to have a stronger adoption and that their analytics users are 23% more likely to use BI on at least a weekly basis. And I think this is really just an indication that the business managers are finding value in analytics. They can find the information they need quickly and easily, and so keep going back to the analytics solutions for more. And finally, let's not forget. If your analytics are sufficiently agile, it means less time trying to hack data together in a spreadsheet at the weekend, and more time to enjoy the things we'd all rather be doing instead. Joe, back to you. Hey, thank you so much, David. Our next speaker here is Neil Pratt. Neil is uh, our, our assistant principal of CIS of Bourneville College. Uh, with over a decade of senior IT experience within the education sector, Neil brings a wealth of knowledge related to the development and enhancement of both systems, platforms, and reporting tools. Neil joined Bourneville College in January 2008, where as a part of the college's management team, his prominent role I means that he took responsibility for the preparation of ILR, or Individual Learning Returns, uh, the, the production of funding reports, the development of dashboard reporting systems, plus the day-to-day -day running of the CIS and examination offices for the college. Neil, take it away. Uh, Neil, you may be on mute, uh, or at least I'm not hearing you at the moment. Uh, I'm sorted. Thanks, Thanks Joe. As Joe has just said, I'm part of Bourneville College's management team, responsible for an extensive IT infrastructure that's aligned with our state-of-the-art building at Longbridge in Birmingham. Today I'm going to talk about how a new BI tool from Neutrino BI is helping us to increase our business agility. We are in the early stages following implementation over the summer, but we are already seeing the benefits of using it. Let me introduce Bourneville College to you. Although the college has been in existence for almost 100 years, we have only recently moved into our brand new premises. We have wonderful facilities, so if you are ever in Birmingham, do pay us a visit and see the state-of-the-art building, where we cater for over 15,000 students every year. This year, uh, we have a revenue target of £32 million. And we plan to increase this by up to 20% in the next five years. This may seem like a big ask, but despite the challenges ahead, we do see this as a realistic goal. Further education colleges face many of the same challenges as any other business. In particular, tough economic conditions increase competition between colleges. Fewer students are choosing to stay on, and there are more places available to the most able. State funding is becoming a thing of the past with students expected to contribute to their education by paying fees, which are already high for most students. Colleges are expected to diversify income streams in order to achieve targets and maintain the business. Uh, so that we attract the best students, we need to show value added through first class teaching and learning, facilities and services. For IT, this means providing cutting edge technology and services, but doing so within budget and resource constraints. At the moment, we have an IT team of six looking after 15,000 students and 500 members of staff. Business intelligence is a critical enabler, reporting day-to-day -day performance and providing strategic insight. Unfortunately, we were hampered by, this, by some simple, simplistic visualization tools. What that meant was that we did all the legwork of consolidating data behind the scenes and preparing all the scripts we needed to get it to visualize as a dashboard. Despite that, we've got about 100 dashboards in use today. It's a big ask in terms of our time and resource. And on top of that, we have frequent requests for specific information and new reports, which are rarely a simple task. We heard about Neutrino BI as they're a neighbor to us on Longbridge Technology Park. To be honest, the tool sounded like it was just what we needed, so we had them come in and show, show it to us. 
there were very few barriers to getting Neutrino installed, as it doesn't require us to rip out and replace our existing systems and requires very little effort on our part. So we implemented just a few weeks ago during our summer recess. The initial implementation is focused on two or more or two of our most key reporting areas, ongoing success and achievement and daily attendance records. The source data comes from two different databases, the student records system and the timetabling and attendance database. The first thing that was impressive about Neutrino was the implementation. It's much faster than any other similarly extensive BI project I've been involved with. Basically, it was in within a morning. They took a couple of hours to onboard the data, but with their data acquisition tool, that was pretty easy to do. Uh, it took about another 25 minutes to build the search domain for attendance based on the scheduling and attendance database, and then I could question it. With Neutrino BI, you just type in your query in what looks like a search bar, and it brings back a set of graphs on a carousel. You choose your graphs, drag and drop them onto a canvas, and build up the dashboard you want. It looks something like this. As you can see, dashboards can be customized depending on how you want the graphs to look. The type of graph, the scale, the color, and also security settings so that it can be shared in a secure way if you want it to be. We can also drill down to see any anomalies, even check out the attendance of an individual student if we need to. It's hard to compare Neutrino with our previous capabilities because it's not really like for like. With Neutrino, you can do so much more, not just dashboard reporting, but also in terms of data discovery. In addition to delivering our dashboard reporting, we also want to roll Neutrino BI out to the management team to enable them to do their own data discovery. Because it's easy to use, they can get to the information they want without issuing an IT job request. In testing, I found that Neutrino's in-memory search provides really fast results to questions we couldn't ask before. It would have taken a number of hours to prepare the data to answer these questions shown on the slide. Although it's still very early days having Neutrino in the college, we are planning to take full advantage of its capabilities by rolling it out to up to 60 of the senior managers. We're also looking at their cloud capability to support any international students we have. And we want to develop a specific subset of functionality so that each student can see their own performance and attendance as a dashboard functionality that would also be useful to tutors, advisors, and also employers of anybody doing an apprenticeship or educational day release course. Neutrino BI has also let us know of their iPad development being released next year. We can see that this would be a great opportunity for us to give students and staff a mobile access point. All in all, the need for up-to-date data, in-depth management information is being satisfied by the use of Neutrino BI and given us the capabilities to enhance the agility of our business intelligence platforms. Back to you, Joe. Thank you kindly. Uh, our final presenter for today will be Neil Thomas. Neil is the sales director for Neutrino BI. He joined the Neutrino BI startup team almost two years ago in early 2010. As a sales director, he's responsible for developing the Neutrino BI go-to-market strategy and value chains, establishing the sales team, and recruiting both channel partners and end customers. Before joining Neutrino BI, Neil was a senior VP and general manager of I2 International, senior manager at De uh, Decada, and na national sales manager of SunGuard and regional account management systems at Siemens. Neil, take it away. I'd like to start by taking my phone off mute. <laughs> right, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to start by saying a big thank you to Neil and to Bourneville College for sharing with us how Neutrino BI is making their business more agile. Neutrino is a next generation BI tool. It's been specifically designed to deliver agile BI and to make the use of BI more pervasive throughout the best in class organizations. In the next few slides, I'm going to take a look at the recommendations of the Aberdeen Group for agile BI and give you a brief overview of how Neutrino could enable agility within your organization. 
Earlier on, we heard David talking about the difference that Agile BI makes to the bottom line of the best-in-class companies. But he also mentioned that over half of the companies surveyed continue to struggle to meet the business intelligence needs of their managers in a timely fashion. These companies remain on a quest for Agile BI. It's a quest that the Aberdeen Group suggests should start with a docking or a collaboration on strategies between their business managers and the IT department. From there, best-in-class companies equip their managers or data explorers, as we like to call them. Oops, I pressed the right button. Um, sorry, they equip their managers or data explorers with the tools that enable them to explore their business data for themselves and to develop their own dashboards and reports. The bottom line? Well, David and his team found that the best-in-class companies, it meant that. Business managers found the information that they needed when they needed it almost all of the time. They halved the time that it took to complete a BI project. They developed new dashboards in a fraction of the time that it takes with more traditional BI products. And they achieved a return on investment on their latest BI project in half the time that it takes companies without Agile BI tools. What's more, and most importantly, they grew their annual operating profit by 5% more than the other companies in the survey. With the right toolkit, companies can achieve more Agile BI today. In the next slide, I'd like to take a look at the key elements of this toolkit that can help make a difference to your bottom line. The research shows that to enable Agile BI, organizations must equip their business users with the right self-service BI tools. The Aberdeen Group suggests that there are five key factors of a BI tool that best equip users in their quest for agility. First is the ability to search using natural language, free from the constraints of drop-down menus or pre-canned results. Secondly, for the user to be able to combine data sources themselves. For example, to be able to add your local data from, say, an Excel spreadsheet and easily combine it with other corporate data. Next, to be able to drill down and review the live underlying atomic level data. Fourthly, business users want to create their own visualizations to suit their own purposes. And finally, they need the capability to fully interact with the data, using fresh data to build new dashboards without IT involvement. The challenge is to find a BI toolkit that helps you to deliver this functionality to business users across the organization in a way that's simple, fast, and efficient. And that's where Neutrino BI comes in. But what makes it the right tool to enable your quest for Agile BI? Well, firstly, we have a unique free-form search capability that allows users to ask a sentence-like question in a similar way to an internet search engine. Neutrino will return a set of graphical results matched to your question. And it doesn't matter where the data resides, in an enterprise data warehouse, a departmental database, in the cloud, or in a local application. Because Neutrino is an in-memory analytic platform, results are typically returned in less than 10 seconds, even on the largest data sets. You can combine data across different data sources. Our Agile data integration makes it easy to bring in new data, including locally held spreadsheets, in less than 30 seconds. Drill down is quick and it's easy. In a matter of seconds, you can simply click on any point on the graph to see the underlying source data and seamlessly navigate between graphical and tabular views. Business users can create their own fresh visualizations on new data in less than a minute. It's your insight. Display it the way that you want to. New dashboards showing multiple data sources can be designed, created, and shared in less than five minutes, allowing you to collaborate on business challenges. And what's more, all of this is done without IT involvement. So your IT staff are free from day-to-day -day information requests to focus on the bigger challenges. So what does it look like? Well, on the surface, for consumer users, Neutrino is similar to other more traditional BI products in that it delivers all that you would expect from a dashboarding tool. The dashboard here 
shows a range of chart types reflecting different views of data that are important for managing business performance. These dashboards can be displayed on large screens, exported into office products, or shared with other users in order to collaborate on a particular project. So far, much as you'd expect from a traditional BI tool. However, the big difference with Neutrino is the agility that it gives to business users who want to explore and discover for themselves. Neutrino's freeform search capability allows users to ask their own questions of their own data. Now, it's tricky to read on this screenshot here, but the user is typing in, show me the number of students in 2011 for sciences by gender, by course. The green and red writing appearing below the dialog box is our autocomplete capability, and it's derived automatically from the underlying data structure and offered to the user as they start to type and the terms are recognized. Neutrino is unique in the world of business intelligence in that we use a patented search algorithm to actually search across all the data sources. The search algorithm understands the context in which words appear based upon the hierarchies, the facts, and the measures within the data, and it ranks the results like a search engine would. This means that you'll get a number of charts generated depending upon the combination of search terms entered and their frequency of occurrence within the data. Now, it sounds complicated, and the algorithm is, but to the user, it's very straightforward. What it means, though, is that you get the ability to explore your data using your own language, allowing you to uncover previously hidden associations that lead to new insights. In this next slide, the search has returned 140 results that match the search criteria to varying degrees. These are displayed in a carousel on the bottom of the right-hand bottom right -hand side of the screen. The closest match is returned first, and the other results can be scrolled through to look for spikes or anomalies in the data that would require further investigation. The important thing is that none of these charts previously existed. Nobody's had to build them. They're only rendered when the data is returned, and they will only exist while they're being viewed unless the user chooses to save them. To place a chart onto the canvas on the left of the screen, the user simply clicks on the chart and it's automatically moved onto the dashboard. This process would typically take less than 30 seconds from searching, finding a chart, and placing it on the dashboard. The user can then continue to scroll through the carousel of results, identifying other charts that they're interested in, placing these onto the canvas, and building up the dashboard as they go. In this screen, the user has decided to ask a different question by branching the question tree. They've now typed in, show me the number of students in 2011 for sciences by ethnicity by course. Maybe they're looking to compare the ethnic mix of students with the gender mix of students on different courses. Again, it's quick and the dashboard can be built up in the same way comparing the different charts on the same canvas. Importantly, Neutrino also has the ability to visually combine two different charts or data sources on the dashboard in front of you. So in this case, the user could simply overlay the gender and ethnicity data on the same chart. The result is a dynamic dashboard created by the user with no recourse to IT and styled to reflect the preferred chart types of the colors and the, and the, and the colors that the user has chosen to create the most impact. The user can also choose how frequently the data and therefore the charts are refreshed. This dashboard can now be published to the wider user community, exported to an office product, or published as view only. It can also be shared with others in the organization to collaborate on with additional data. Now that's probably all I've got time for today. But if I've managed to whet your appetite, there are a number of different ways in which you can find out more about Neutrino BI. Firstly, you can visit our website or take a look at the um, Agile BI infographic or read the flyer. You can watch the demo on YouTube, or you can contact me and request a personal demonstration. But to really see the power of Neutrino BI, why not try it for yourself? We're very happy to prove our capability by running proof of concepts on your data in your environment. Now, there is a small charge for this, but you'll really get to appreciate the benefits that Agile BI and data discovery can bring to your business. Because it's such an agile tool and it's very easy to integrate with your data, this can often be done in around half a day. If you'd like to find out more, 
please feel free to drop me an email and we can arrange to have a conversation to talk about the best approach for your business. Right, I better hand back to Joe, our moderator now. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you so much, Neil. That was great and uh, gives us some time for Q&A here. Just as a reminder to the audience, uh, submit a question. Just click the Ask a Question tab and uh, type your question and click Submit. Uh, we did receive a number of great questions, and I'll, I'll uh, ask the first now. Um, this was received during David's presentation. Uh, how do you see organizations using analytics against big data? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a very good question. Certainly um, what we've seen in big data, and we did publish a report on this just a, a month or two ago, actually, one of the things that we see from an analytics perspective, if we forget about the data management piece for a second, Self-service is even more important when it comes to big data. So uh, organizations working with big data are uh, more likely to have users that engage directly with the data and have drilled down and exploration and discovery capabilities. Those users are more likely to be involved in how they shape the projects. I think one of the things about big data, right, is there's so many public data sources now available and so much data coming off the web that we're finding that really innovative business leaders are starting to have ideas, well, what if we take this data and this data and put it together and how does that all work together? So the self-servicing is really, really strong on the, uh, on the, the big data side. And um, partly that comes back to what I said earlier. The the IT organization is so swamped dealing with all the data coming in, they don't have time to create reports and dashboards. And so self-service becomes even more important because IT is just dealing with all the data. Neil, yeah, what do you see from your side? Well, from our side, it's it's not so much about the, the complexity of the data, but more about the size of the data. Um, I mean, traditional BI tools, SQL query tools, for example, can take hours to be, uh, to, to be effective on big data. It's kind of our sweet spot because Neutrino BI aggregates the data at source. So we only take into memory um, roughly no more than 1% of the, of the source data. And we carry out our analytics on that data in memory. So we can provide a very quick response to very large volumes of data. And once we've brought it into memory, we can have multiple users accessing that data, asking different queries at the same time. So again, I think I concur with your points there. It's about being able to self-serve, but it's also about being able to access the data in a timely fashion, which to us is about taking an aggregate out and bringing that into memory. So you're not overloading and overburdening the systems that you're operating on. That's about it. Great. Thanks so kindly. Uh, this question here is, uh, what, what can I encourage? What do I do? Uh, is this the same question? What can I do to encourage business managers to use analytics? I believe that's a different one. Uh, so that question was uh, also asked during David's presentation. Sure, I, can, uh, I can talk to that. Um, so certainly the, uh, that whole supporting infrastructure that I talked about is very, very important. There really needs to be... You know, that cultural expectation that, that senior managers are going to let go of making every single decision that happens and that the, the data-driven organization is, is uh, going to be pushed down throughout the management levels, I think, uh, is that cultural expectation has to be there. But then it really is making sure that people are comfortable with working with data and working with the tools they have and working with the, the their own actual data and the tools in training is great too. And I think this is becoming much easier now. We have uh, obviously a, a generation coming through who, well, they look at data on Facebook and they look at data on LinkedIn and they can they can do charts and all that stuff online themselves and their iPads are so easy to use. And well, gee, why doesn't data in the office work like this? Why, why can't I have access to information the same way that I can see things on my iPad in, in, you know, in, the, in my private life? So... That cultural expectation is is uh, being driven from the the grassroots upwards now as well, and so I think there's there are is more eagerness now from business people to actually engage with the data themselves. There's the expectation when they come out of college and go into the corporate world that they're going to be able to do that. So I think that really helps to to make that switch happen as well. Can I just comment on that as well, Joe? Mm -hmm. Sure, yes, please. It's Neil. I think, uh, I mean, some of our experience has been around, particularly around the user interface side of things. I mean, traditionally, um, you know, some old, some BI systems have been uh, have been fairly complex to be able to use. Um, from a senior man management perspective, it's also just about um, exposing to senior managers how simple you can make um, the use of BI so it doesn't become something that slows down um, a manager's role but actually enhances their ability to perform their role. Um, and actually involving senior management in the decisions around what tools are being chosen um, and taking their viewpoints in terms of making that part of the selection criteria is also very important. Great. Thanks so much. 
Next question here is, what advantage do you get from in-memory analytics, and do I need anything special to get it? Um, well, I, I can start off on that. So uh, the advantage you get really is, is tremendous speed um, of manipulation of data. And so uh, you can imagine perhaps if you're trying to drill down through data or slice and dice it different ways and isolate different subsets and look at those, um, if every time you click the mouse it takes three minutes to to actually refresh that view of the data for you, then that's that's not a very compelling and interactive experience because you just you just lose the thread of your thought process that way. So by pulling all the relevant data into into random access memory, you can make those analytics really in, happen in the blink of an eye as you click the mouse. And so that's that's really where the power of it comes through. I think is is just sheer enablement of interactive manipulation of data. Can I add a touch in there as well, Joe? Of course. And, and, I, and I probably would say this, but I think one of the, um, the barriers to, to in-memory um, analytics has been you know, the growing volume of data and actually moving sufficient volumes of data into memory. Obviously, you know, the network uh, restrictions there and then actually the memory of the, or the processing power of the, of the devices you're using. It's the reason that we've taken the approach of, of, of aggregating the data at source and then bringing across that aggregate data. You know, if we're bringing back less than 1% of the source data, it makes it a lot easier to put the data into memory and therefore to apply your analytics in that environment. Thank you so much. Uh, does New Chain uh, accommodate multiple languages other than English? Uh, yes, it does. Oh, wonderful. All right, that's great. Thank you. And uh, let's see what other questions we have here. Uh, how are the uh, data structures in memory? Uh, are they by columns? Um, the the two-part question here, they also wrote, uh, is it necessary to uh, filter any structure uh, and structure them through an ETL? No, we, we don't require any, any ETL. Uh, we, do, we do supply as part of Neutrino a, a, a translation tool, which allows us to translate um, underlying data into business terminology. Um, it's very simple to use, and, uh, and it's part of our uh, data take-on process, but there's no ETL. Okay, and as the, uh, the data memory, is it, how is it structured uh, in memory? Is it by columns? Oh, you've got me on that one. I need to bring in a techie for that one, I'm afraid. All right, will do. Understood. I, actually, I, I have the, uh, the user's information, so we'll, we'll reach out to them uh, following the webinar. Um, and this, this question here reads, how easy is it for me to share the results of my analysis? Uh, from our perspective, it's very easy. Uh, you, you simply choose to pub publish, and then you invite whoever you wish to, uh, to uh, uh, join in and, and, and utilize the, uh, the, uh, the, the charts or uh, dashboards you produce. However, um, it is all security and access control, though, so you can only share um, in terms of collaboration with other users who have the same or um, a higher uh, security and access level than yourself. Thanks. Um, so the question here, how, how does search work against structured data? Um, I did cover that one in the presentation. Um, we um, recognize the, uh, the facts and the dimensions within the data, and we've got a, um, a patented algorithm um, which we uh, use against um, the, those, those data structures in order to um, look at things like relevance and occurrence within the data um, to pipeline, sorry, to, to select the, uh, the appropriate um, charts that most closely match, very similar to, a, to an, uh, an internet search engine, but actually specifically structured for, stru sorry, specifically aligned for structured data. Great, and so we you. patented it. <laughs> of course. Well, I'll thank you all. That was great, and uh, that, that was really helpful, and we got through a number of the audience questions, so um, I, I do appreciate all of that. Uh, this does bring us to the conclusion of the webinar. I'd like to thank our presenters, uh, David White, Neil Pratt, and Neil Thomas, for their research, their insights, and all the recommendations. That's very uh, promising news, and it uh, seems like a lot of, a lot of uh, so uh, great software for a, a lot of people to uh, benefit from. Uh, I also want to thank our participants who are on the line for listening and uh, for in their interest and their participation in the event, and, of course, our sponsor, Neutrino BI, for making the webinar possible. I hope you all found it beneficial, and we do wish you the best wherever you may be. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening, guys.